introduction from our Councilwoman Shannon Truxell, who is here with us today. We'll have an overview from our city manager, Scott Meyer, on um, the various safety prevention and policy uh, things we've got going on within the city. And then um, Shannon will come back and explain how crime prevention actually starts in the home. Um, so feel free, those of you that are, are watching uh, live or recorded, go ahead and drop your questions in the chat. Um, if you're watching the recorded version, just um, contact us on social media or otherwise, and we'll get your question answered. So thank you so much for everyone for being with us today. Thanks. Shannon, the floor is yours, madam. Sure, thank you, Nicolette. Um, and thank you all for being here and taking part of this webinar. You know, this is really the first step in helping keep Cape safe. Um, just some brief background information about myself. Um, I do have a degree in biology and a master's in criminal justice. And I have worked in law enforcement and surveillance operations along with private investigations for over 16 years. And I was a former nuisance abatement officer here with the city of Cape Girardeau from 2014 to 2017. And nuisance abatement officers generally deal with animal control issues, wildlife concerns, along with uh, litter and property issues, nuisance properties, and other chronic nuisance violations. Um, so it's interesting to be on council now and find that we're still dealing with some of the same properties that I addressed back in 2014 to 2017. So um, I am also the current city council liaison for the Keep Cape Beautiful Committee and the Parks and Recreation Foundation. And the Keep Cape Beautiful Committee does work to identify litter concerns and we do work to create like litter pickup uh, events and we do have one scheduled for March 27th from 9 to 12. Um, they also conduct annual litter tours across the city to identify problem areas um, that we can refer to news and statement to address. Um, and we also nominate our beautiful properties of the month which the mayor recognizes at our city council meetings. Um, so it is important for me to participate in this virtual learning series because much of my experience both in my professional career and my current council responsibilities is so much tied into public safety. So from a council, council perspective, public safety is not just our top goal, but it's actually embedded into everything that we do. It's embedded into how we identify concerns. Um, we welcome the complaints from the community, especially items that are of um, great and urgent need and essentially trying to create an overall better quality of life for our citizens. So it's imperative that for public safety to be effective, our city government must work with our emergency services and our citizens to work together to keep Cape safe. Um, with public safety, we know that our fire department and our police department primarily has a responsive or a reactive role in helping our citizens. Uh, and they are our heroes. They risk their lives daily to help us in our most desperate times. But for the purpose of this webinar, we really wanna focus on the preventative aspects of our public safety. Uh, and this includes how we hire our personnel, our various outreach programs, our infrastructure, how it's designed to keep in mind for public safety, our neighborhood development initiatives and chronic nuisance issues. So we also wanna talk about how you can secure your home and business and how you can generally be a good partner in your community by inviting your neighbors to become more proactive and identifying items of concern, whether it's criminal related or nuisance related and how you can ensure that we are a safer community. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Scott Meyer and he's gonna talk about some of the department specific items and policies that we have in place. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, uh, we have uh, a great uh, deal of, of work that we do in the public safety arena. And uh, as, uh, as Shannon pointed out earlier, it's, it is uh, really, though, a thread in everything we do. If you look at those uh, five goals, um, sure, public safety is, is center, but if you, if you look deeper into um, a strong economy, uh, a strong neighborhood, those things are important uh, to safety because they provide preventive work when it comes to crime and, uh, and safety. So the stronger our economy is, the less uh, unemployment we have and, and, uh, and that makes for a stronger environment, uh, stronger neighborhoods, uh, people watching out for one another, people reporting things that look a little unusual. Those things are really in the fabric of safety and are important to what we do. Um, when you look at streamlining our services, for instance, uh, we just have gone through a huge uh, modernization of our radio, our 911 and our CAD system, which is the, the dispatching system that we have 
that took us from uh, a rather archaic system uh, to now a, a state-of-the-art system that allows us to, to better uh, process 911 calls, to track them, and uh, to, pr to uh, produce data that then allows us to um, really um, study what is happening, when it's happening, where it's happening, in order to uh, be more predictive in nature of, uh, of crime and, and of, uh, of policing. And so that allows us to do a better job and, uh, and, and uh, do that. So streamlining those services is important, not only from a, from a standpoint of saving money, but also in quality of the data that we have and quality of the response that we have. Of course, fiscal discipline, if you're going to be, uh, if you're gonna do all this, you're gonna to have to have money to do it. And so we have, uh, we take all of our five goals that the council has established for us and we align our spending in, in those uh, five areas to make sure that we are prioritizing the tax dollars that, uh, that we get from citizens to spend them on those priorities. And so uh, public safety being a priority that allows us to, to be disciplined in how we spend and uh, make sure that we're spending it on the most important things uh, as identified by, uh, by our elected officials. And so that's really important. But then even a step beyond that, um, I went to a, 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 a training with uh, the Disney Corporation uh, and they talked about how their safety uh, is, is really a, um, a value that, that permeates everything that they do in a way that's kind of unusual. So they, they said uh, that every person on the park can shut down any ride or any, any process that's happening immediately if they see a safety concern. And that keeps every single person engaged in that safety. And the reason they do that is because they said, if, if our parks ever get perceived as not being safe, it doesn't matter how great our rides are or our entertainment is, people are not gonna come where they don't, where, where they don't perceive that they're safe. And that's really true for our city as well. People are not gonna to move to our city or come to our city or visit our city if they perceive that uh, it's not a safe place to come. So really we try to instill uh, and as one of our values, the safety of every single, in every single employee. And, uh, and we really try to, to have it permeate each of those goals as we talked about before. So sure, I, and, and, and no denying uh, our fire and police personnel or other personnel that are involved in safety are, are absolutely key. They're the human capital that we have that, uh, that confronts people and assists people in what is oftentimes their worst day of their life, if not uh, one of the worst days of their life. And uh, that results in, in confrontation. It results in, uh, in, uh, in trying to communicate and uh, sometimes it, it results in incarceration. But uh, most of the time it, it, it results in someone coming from the police or fire or, or the city and and really setting down and, and making that interaction uh, calm down and, uh, and people be able to find a safe place. So that's, that's really the key to what we do. And so we try to support that human capital, that human uh, element, uh, because they are really the part that makes it work. That's, we spend a lot of money on training, on their safety, and, um, and it's really critical that we do so because we want the best training um, it's a complicated world out there. It's not just about, uh, about um, writing people tickets. You know, oftentimes it's the psychology. It's working with someone who has a, a mental illness. It's working with someone who might be ment uh, impaired because of drugs or alcohol. Um, those, are, those are difficult uh, interactions to, uh, to really um, navigate through. And uh, our officers are trained and are evaluated and uh, we have cameras so that we can uh, evaluate every interaction um, and we do so and we use that as training in order to get the best response and the best uh, interactions that we possibly can and have found that to be true. So th those are some of those things but, uh, but then there's also some environmental um, items that they've asked us to talk about and that's really, uh, if, if you look at transportation, if you look at our street designs, um, 
one thing that you've seen recently in the last 10 years is, uh, is roundabouts. Um, so we've gone to a, a roundabout system, which is a more efficient and more effective way of, of uh, traffic interacting. Um, you don't have to pay for signal lights. You don't have to pay for the energy to run in signal lights and they run more efficiently and safer. Uh, ultimately, they, they really do reduce uh, amount of, uh, amount of uh, accidents and, uh, and work very well. Sidewalks is another uh, item that we've spent quite a bit of, uh, of effort on uh, and we put sidewalks almost on every single uh, street that we have and uh, we maintain those when we come through. So ADA requires us to make sure that when we come through and, and resurface the street or do something, that we also make sure that the pedestrian traffic has a safe way of navigating through that through, and we have to meet ADA standards. So sometimes you see us taking out a lot of trees, which of course is uh, uh, to some people is not a, a good thing, but it's a requirement that we have that we have to do in order to make sure that the pedestrians uh, who are disabled can navigate through those areas safely. And that's a requirement that we do have and one that we honor and, uh, and, we're and, uh, and so it, there's that back and forth to keeping trees and not keeping trees. And uh, sometimes you can't, you can't keep the trees as well as meet the ADA uh, standards. So that's just some transportation design work. There's a lot of other design work we do that makes our streets safer when we rework them. Uh, certainly uh, getting rid of potholes and things like that also makes them safer. Uh, neighborhood development, we uh, have had an emphasis on neighborhood development uh, through our neighborhood development initiative, which tries to get neighbors together and they organize and really we, we call it self-governance. And so uh, back in the olden days, we used to say, um, you know, neighbors kind of looked after neighbors. And, uh, and when I grew up, when I was uh, out running around the neighborhood and I got out of line, it might be the, the neighbor's uh, parent who, uh, who got me in line and uh, disciplined me. Um, we, we, we ask really neighbors to watch out for other neighbors and if their grass is getting high, maybe go over and ask them about cutting their grass or, or maybe cut their grass because you find out that they're in the hospital. So self-governance. And then we also have a link to that through staff that sometimes city staff does have to step in. But we, our emphasis on neighborhood development is to try to get people to talk to one another, to talk over the fence, to keep an eye on each other's house when they're out of town and do those types of things. So it's a, it's been a... A, a good um, uh, product that is that we really emphasized uh, the Red Star District and uh, the South Side, but now then we've reached out some other some other areas uh, and using Nextdoor an app uh, have really got other neighborhoods involved in this as well and uh, really is helping our public safety. Our building stock since I've been here we have uh, we have actually condemned uh, well over a hundred. Uh, buildings and houses. Uh, it's not something that we want to have to tear down. Um, uh, we've, we've actually had more houses that have been repaired because of our, our policy of uh, condemnation, but there are some that just uh, are to the point where they, they refuse to do anything and they aren't such that we can sa salvage them and we have to, to tear them down. So, um, but that's an important part because uh, danger can live inside of dangerous buildings and uh, you can have uh, a, a crime that goes on and, and problems that go on with, with those types of buildings. And so it's been one of our, one of our uh, initiatives that we have done. We also started a, 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 a committee and a, a policy passed by council called chronic nuisance. This is, these are nuisance uh, issues that are are either very very severe, like a uh, you know some severe crime, or um, or just uh, chronic um, nuisances like uh, litter, trash, uh, public parties, um, uh, other things like that. That when we see it chronically, uh, we can actually deem that property to be a chronic nuisance, and then we can actually have uh, it cleaned up uh, and or we can actually keep people from occupying those those uh, properties. Uh, that's been a tool that's worked for us in several times and has 
got part uh, properties cleaned up and uh, turned around. Um, we also started a landlord licensing program. Uh, we, we have uh, now landlords have to license their properties. They have to tell us all the properties they have. And then they have a list of minimum standards that they have to keep. Uh, we then inspect them. And um, if they don't meet those minimum standards or if we get a complaint from a tenant about those minimum standards, we then uh, uh, can cite them. We can again uh, remove their occupancy permit. And uh, we have with that uh, had several properties that we went from uh, problem properties to uh, properties that uh, are well maintained and, uh, and well uh, leased. Um, we also have uh, uh, within that program, a, a rental crime notification with our new technology. We were able to uh, merge the landlord licensing properties to our crime and we're able to notify our landlords. And this lets the landlords know when there is crime happening at their, um, at their locations, at their uh, properties, and uh, lets them be proactive in taking action to that. And so that's been a very um, uh, well used program as well that uh, is again on the more proactive side of uh, taking care of, uh, of our safe, safe city. So that's, that's just some of the things we do for Safe Cape and I've gone on a little longer than I should have. So I'll, I'll end my part and, and uh, give it back to Shannon. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Um, so let's talk about some of the specific ways that citizens can become more proactive in crime, crime prevention, starting with your own home. Our police department actually has a home security checklist, which you can access the link in the chat. I believe it's on there uh, or go to cityofcape.org where you can actually locate this little home security checklist. Um, there's some specific items in here that are essential to just general home, home safety. Um, I'm gonna add a couple things that I think are important for people to know that aren't necessarily on this list, but it's important to actually take the step to go through this list and make sure that maybe there are some areas in your home that might need to be addressed to better enforce your home or structure. Um, one thing I really like to do is to incorporate children into this, um, maybe have your kids draw a map make it like a little bit of an art project. Maybe they can identify exits in case of emergency. Um, you know, if we have a problem in one part of the home, how do we get out safely? Um, so those are conversations that you should have with your children, involve them in this. Um, they need to be aware of what to do when there is a problem or an emergency. Um, we should always lock our exterior doors. Um, this includes our storm doors. Uh, if anyone comes to your property and you have a storm door, keep that door locked. So if you open up the door, you can communicate through the glass and not exposing yourself directly to that person. Um, all of our garage doors or exterior uh, detached structures should also be locked, including the doors from your garage to the interior of your home. Um, make sure that you have one trusted neighbor. I know Scott had talked about this. If you're going to be away on vacation, make sure that someone that you trust has a key to your property. If police or fire are dispatched to your home, um, that neighbor can come to the scene and say, hey, I have a key. Um, instead of breaking down a door or going through a window, they might be able to unlock that structure to cause less damage to the property. Um, another thing to note as well, which isn't necessarily on this home security checklist, is if you have pets or animals, you can actually purchase those little window decals or door decals that you can post to identify whether or not you have animals on the property how many there are so that if we do need to dispatch police or fire, they know to actually make uh, arrangements to get those animals out of the home. Um, we can also do a better job at making sure when we have police come to our property or fire that we secure the animals ourselves so that if they do come inside, that does not cause injury or harm to the first responders. Uh, for garage doors, one thing that you wouldn't always think about is that if you have a car parked in your parking lot that has a garage door opener and someone breaks into that car, that means they now have the garage door opener to your property. So those should be removed from your vehicle if you do not normally park your car inside the garage. Don't leave items like cash or bill folds or driver's license, credit cards, debit cards, or even spare keys to another vehicle inside your cars. They need to be secured inside your home. Um, if you have sliding doors, something to think about is to make sure you have a wood dowel or some type of locking pin so that those doors can't be slid over to the side for large items to be removed from your home. 
Um, make sure you lock all of your windows, no matter what time of the year it is. Uh, some windows have the top locks and some of them have pin locks. Um, there is the rare occasion, even if you're renting a property that perhaps they're gonna do some carpet removal or repair. And that means that someone might come into your property to actually conduct a maintenance activity. They may, might need to open up those windows to allow for dust to escape or some other activity. And they might not necessarily close them before they leave. So it's always important that you actually check your property whenever you have any maintenance work done on it uh, after those individuals leave your home. Um, for bushes and other shrubs, this ties into our nuisance uh, restrictions. Those items need to be trimmed back. Um, if you have uh, portions of your property that are on a right of way, perhaps you have tree limbs or bushes that are extending out into the road, they also need to be cut back so that we can allow for safe travel for vehicles um, to and from your property. If you have a fire hydrant on your property, make sure that you have nothing within three feet of that fire hydrant that could prevent the fire department from actually accessing that hydrant. Um, we also know that litter is a problem on some properties. So make sure that you're picking up. We, we know that um, litter can scatter in the elements. So when you are putting your trash cans curbside, they need to be placed the night before and they need to be removed the same day. And we need to make sure that they can't blow in the wind and cause a, a traffic obstruction in the street uh, and be scattered by the elements. So that's also something to think about. Um, as well as firewood, if you stack firewood on your property, don't stack that next to your home. That invites other pesky insects that might actually invade the wood structure of your property. It can also cause uh, insects or other types of spiders or even snakes to be that much closer to your residence. So you wanna actually remove all those items from the base of your house and make sure that's all cleaned up. Um, we also talked about um, in the last webinar series with the neighborhoods that that Ameren might have an easement or access to any type of utilities, including power lines on your property. So if you notice that there are some trees leaning on those power lines, you might wanna contact Ameren, see if they can come out and actually remove those limbs for safety, safety reasons. Um, another thing that people don't think about a lot because we are in Southeast Missouri and we don't always have bad weather uh, with regard to snow and ice, but a couple weeks ago, we did have a really good snowstorm and a lot of our pedestrian sidewalks were not cleared. Um, and you really need to identify if you are a tenant on a property, if your lease states whether or not you are responsible for removing the snow and ice from the premises. So otherwise property owner is responsible for maintaining to that right away for the safety of the rest of our citizens. Um, lighting is big keys to the safety and security of your home uh, and business. So, check to make sure that all of your floodlights work. If you have burnt out bulbs, replace them. Uh, if they're too high up or you need a ladder to access it, see if a neighbor has a ladder to come over and help you with that. If you do have ladders, that's not something you should leave outside on your property because anyone that wants to gain entry can actually use a ladder to get into your home. Uh, so that's something else to, to think about to secure those items. Other items that should be secured inside a garage or other shed would be children's toys, bikes, anything of value that's in your yard, like cooking grills. Um, you know, it's fine outside during the daytime, but at night, make sure you bring those items and secure them properly on your premises. Um, if you have security systems, make sure they're functioning properly and that if you do have animals in your home, make sure that they're not set up in a way that the animals can falsely set off those alarm systems. We try to alleviate a lot of false alarms that for police and fire to be dispatched. So uh, when you do get a new security system, test it, make sure that those animals aren't setting it off. Uh, if you're planning on being away for vacation, again, like we just touched, touched on, don't make those arrangements public. Do not put that on social media. You're in the grocery store chatting with the checker, say, oh, I'm gathering all these items because we're going on vacation. You don't know if someone in line with you is going to follow you home knowing that you are going on vacation. So keep that, those things private and make sure that you have someone to come get your mail, make arrangements or stop your mail. Um, other things to think about when we talk about putting mail out for pickup, try not to do that at night, um, do that during the day. So you don't want outgoing mail that could have checks, check information sitting in your mailbox for anyone to come by and remove from your mailbox. Um, you can also request the police department to do vacation checks. They do do, do that service for the community. Um, so if you want an officer to swing by and just check to make sure all the doors and windows are secured, um, they would be happy to do that for you. Um, we also talk about 
items and inventories. And at the bottom of our home security checklist, there's actually a website that you can go to to log all of your valuable items and it is on report it online. So you can access that document and enter any high value items that have serial numbers. And the police department actually can use that to recover stolen property. Um, so if you do have a home inventory list that's a paper form, that's not something you actually wanna keep in the home. You wanna keep that in a separate area outside the home or maybe in a lockbox. Um, so now that we talked about some of the structural issues and how to prevent uh, people from coming into the home with that, we also wanna talk about having people come to your property and what your rights are as an individual with regard to people soliciting or canvassing. So I know that over the summer that we had some instances where people were selling um, home security systems coming to doors. In fact, I had an individual actually come to my home um, and most recently with some vacuum sales. And you'd be surprised, but council members actually do read some of these comments on social media. So we know that there is an issue we wanna to try to address it. Um, these activities are actually covered under chapter 15. So under chapter 15, 15, solicitation is actually not allowed in or upon any private residence for the purpose of selling uh, or soliciting orders without having been requested by the owner of the occupant or the occupant of the private residence. Uh, we also, under our chapter 22 of our municipal code, which covers solid waste and weeds, um, the distribution of solicitation for handbills or any type of notice of an activity where you know someone might be mowing grass or they want a product to sell, those items actually can't be distributed or deposited on your private property. Um, but you need to know that if you don't want any of that, the best way to avoid that is to actually have no, no trespass or no solicitation signs posted on your property. Um, and we talk about how our elderly community is targeted in this respect. If you have an elderly family member that lives alone, that's something that you might want to consider is to post their property for their protection. Um, there are some activities that are actually exempt from this. So anyone that is canvassing for census activities, we did have census takers out this past summer, um, and even people that are involved in um, religious activities where they're going door to door. Maybe we have Jehovah's Witnesses passing out pamphlets or maybe individuals that are passing out Bibles. Those are exempt from that ordinance. Um, and we actually do have some political activity going on right now with regard to our current referendum committee going around soliciting signatures from our voters in the city that is allowed. And so if you happen to see those individuals out and about, that is something that is allowed in our city limits and they are currently doing those activities at this time. Uh, for virtual related scams, my best advice to anyone is just don't put your information out there. If you are an avid social media user, don't post anything personal on there, try not to. Um, if you're gonna be purchasing items online and we've done a lot of that because of COVID, um, you are actually more at risk for having your credit card or debit card information stolen. It's important that you actually check your bank accounts, contact your financial institution if you, the moment that you see something that looks suspicious on your statements. Um, and you know, check every week, see what's going on. Um, we know that we are more in an online buying system right now. So you might also want to consider getting some type of fraud protection, which can be reasonably purchased for you know one to three dollars a month. So you have that added benefit. Um, when you're engaging in Facebook Marketplace or sell at CMO, um, you're not going to want to have people come to your house to purchase these items. You would want to go to a public place and perhaps bring a friend so that that transaction actually goes smoothly. Uh, the, I know that there are some items that people sell. They might be couches or large products, but in all actuality, don't, don't post any pictures where maybe the outside of your residence is there with an address. You really want to be safe with regard to what type of photos and images that you are posting online for sales purposes. And that goes for both the buyer and the seller. Um, so we're gonna talk about other ways that we can increase public safety by partnering, partnering with our neighbors and our police department. Uh, we touched briefly based uh, about the having security systems established into your home or affixed to the outside of your home. And if you're really considering actually purchasing surveillance equipment, you really need to do your research. Um, we know that some of those systems can be expensive. 
Um, but you never want to sacrifice security because of a financial commitment. Um, you know, you really have to think to yourself, what is the actual cost to benefit of installing something like this if it's going to protect my family and the items that I have. Um, so we know that surveillance systems work. That we are in a digital society. We know people have cameras all the time that are out and about. Um, and even systems that are on a home or multiple systems in a neighborhood can actually identify, even if there's nothing on the camera, where someone went to if they were on foot. Maybe you had a neighbor that had their home broken into, but your camera didn't catch anything, that might indicate that that person came from another direction. So that's all actually good information that the police can use to solve crimes. The police department actually does have a camera registration form, which is also available on our website. Um, and it's also under the police department's website under registration and permits. And I think we're gonna try and get a link under crime prevention as well. But so this is basically the security camera form. and. This does not mean that if you fill this out and submit it to the police department that they have access to your cameras. It just identifies that there is a camera at a location. They can contact you if there's something that's going on and you can review your footage and see if you actually have something on there. Um, when I fill out mine, I actually provide a map of the property identifying where every camera is. And I think that would be a great benefit to our police department as well. So also, Think about with your neighbors, if you really do have a problem in your neighborhood and they're trying to catch different things that are going on, maybe you're not sure if it's animal related or person related, you can really work with your neighbors to direct different cameras to a specific area that might be dark um, to figure out more of what's going on or just give you better coverage on their property. Um, I know Corporal Couch is excellent in participating with our crime-free multi-housing program and our crime prevention environmental design program, he can be contacted to come out to your property to do a property and security assessment. So he is available to do that. Um, our police department is also uh, involved in the neighborhood watch group and Corporal Couch is also your point of contact if you are really interested in starting a neighborhood watch. Um, he can take you through the process and how to start it, how to hold your meetings, uh, how to get your neighbors involved. And I will say that if anyone is actually participating in this neighborhood watch group, their information would be kept on record with the police department. So if you get contacted from somebody that says, hey, I'm part of a neighborhood watch, but you're like, I don't know this person that is this for real, you can contact the police department and they can tell you whether or not they are registered as the point of contact for a neighbor watch, neighborhood watch program. So what we want in a neighborhood watch is basically bringing the community together um, to observe and report what is going on in the area. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be criminal related activity. I know Scott had touched on um, some nuisance issues and you know, identifying that something's out of the ordinary. Maybe you notice your neighbor's grass is too tall or maybe the trash is piling up or the mail is stacking up in the mailbox. Something else might be actually going on and you would wanna report that to the police department because they would be happy to come out and know that everything is okay, then come to find out weeks later that something happened to that individual in that home. So we, we wanna make sure that we are working together, identifying when things are maybe something that we should report right away. Um, and there's some instances that are not something that you should report right away. Maybe it's just something to actually keep in mind. If it happens again, then maybe just alert your neighbors to what's going on. So we want you to essentially observe and report and report that activity, either if it's an emergency directly to 911, the police department, or using our online reporting system, which you can actually go online and report your nuisance violation or even potholes in the street. Um, and you can do that anonymous, anonymously as well. Um, I know Scott had talked about our next door apps and how that is another way to communicate with your neighbors. I know Ring has partnered with um, the fire department. So you might get a ring notification um, about fires that are going on in the area. Uh, and that's something that you really should try to join because we get a lot of, I mean, I get a lot of notices about uh, cars being broken into in my ward. And I have contacts in that area saying, hey, you know, there's been a lot of break-ins on your street. Just make sure that you secure all your valuables and just get a little bit more communication with our residents. Um, and this goes for any type of weather related activity as well. 
We know that we have national alert systems for amber alerts and silver alerts, and we all probably got our tornado alert last Tuesday on our phone. Um, we know that the technology works, but sometimes it doesn't. So we need to caution everybody that there are drawbacks to the technology that we use. So you need to think about if I did not have my cell phone or device, how would I get a hold of someone? So do I know a phone number for anyone or an address? And also if you have children, do they know your phone number? Do they know how to get a hold of you? I just heard a story yesterday about a young girl who was at a bus stop and she was crying and, and uh, a neighbor came over and said, are you okay? The child missed the bus. And fortunately that neighbor had a wherewithal to contact the school so that parent could be contacted and it, it worked out wonderfully. So those are things that we can all work together in making sure that our children are safe and that we can be better citizens, better community members. So we, we definitely want you to start that neighborhood watch group. Now is the best time to do it. The weather's getting great. Get out there, talk to your neighbors, really engage in the community. And we also talk about what the silver lining is in public safety. It is personal. So when you work and you live and you play in an area that might not be safe, it affects everything about how you go about your daily job or, or, or your home, family, other family members might have mental stresses on them. So when we talk about how we can do better to help each other from a public safety standpoint, we really need to work together as a community to make sure we can help everyone have access to all of these services that are available with the city. And we have many services. We also have contact lists for community services, housing resources, and also uh, elder services. So we would like to have that information all in one uh, stop shop place for you to access. Um, and that's something that we are discussing on how to actually get out to the community so that we know who to contact and when to contact someone. Um, so right now, if I can ask everyone to start participating in the conversation about getting your home secured, have those conversations with your children, have a plan in place. If there's an emergency, you need to know where our emergency services are located in the city, where our nearest shelters are. Um, and you also need to have a meetup point for your family in case you all get separated. Um, we didn't talk about this in one of the services for the fire department, but there is that Pulse Point app. So if you do have a CPR certification, you might be able to reach someone before emergency personnel can respond and potentially save someone's life. Um, and you can also join our Citizens Academy so you could have a better understanding of how we operate and what we do to make this city a better and safer place. Um, so I know that every council member is, their top priority is public safety. You can reach any of us at any time. You can email us, you can call us. Um, some, of, some of you have text messages for us. Please feel free to text message us. Um, you can come to our meetings if you have issues that you're not comfortable um, maybe reporting directly, but maybe you have someone that would be willing to come to a council meeting to report your concern. They are open to the public. So the first and third Mondays of the month, starting at five o'clock, and we look forward to seeing you there. A lot of great resources. Thank you so much to, to both of you, our panelists. Um, if you're watching on Zoom, feel free to uh, submit those questions in chat. If you're watching the recorded version, you can reach out to us on social media or any of the, the resources that uh, Councilwoman uh, Shannon Trexel just mentioned, online, off phone, whatever you, uh, you'd like to do, reach out with those questions. Um, another uh, note about all the various resources available to the community. If you really don't know where to start, don't forget about United Way 211, which is a simple dial of 211 from a, a typical home phone. Or here locally in the Cape County area, specifically uh, 334 Help. They're your first step for if you need help with anything, um, navigating the social services, city services, what have you, um, great first point of contact. And we are working on making all of those resources uh, more accessible. So thank you for that. Um, on with some of the uh, questions. I know one that we get a lot, and Mr. Meyer, I know you have fielded this one. When it comes to safety, mm -hmm. um, folks felt that when we moved the police station to uh, Midtown or West Side, however someone saw it, they felt that it was moving away from uh, crime and, and that felt unsafe. And, and um, Mr. Meyer, could you share uh, with folks what our, our stance is on that? Well, I think uh, to, to a degree, some of, uh, some of our old, uh, uh, watching of TV kind of made us uh, have this model in our head that uh, the police stayed at their building 
And then when they got a call, they left the building uh, and, and went something. Um, certainly, uh, our model is not that. And most police, uh, police uh, do not work from that model. They work from a, a patrolling model where they are in their cars. Their cars have become very sophisticated um, and quite technical. And they basically have their office uh, in, their, in their car. And so they are, they are in and close to, uh, to the neighborhoods on their patrols. I made mention earlier about how um, we have uh, with our uh, CAD systems, the uh, computer aided dispatching, it actually uses uh, the current location of a car to the current location of the call and then helps dispatch the closest uh, available call. So that's how that works. And so I, I understand the perception um, and, and, and you know, there, there may be a little bit of that to thinking about, well, somebody could walk in when it's closer. And, and you know, that's, that's true. Um, but certainly um, we have people call in or, or uh, let us know and we meet them uh, at their home or, or at a, a third party location. Um, and so uh, as far as a safety thing and a response time thing, uh, we don't uh, we don't think that's uh, a valid a valid concern because the police station's really kind of everywhere in the city. Um, it is there is, and that that's great. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, another one, and we actually hear this one um, a lot. And uh, Councilwoman Truxell, you, you pointed uh, to this several times um, about the importance of neighborhood groups and neighborhood watch and um, join one, start one, what have you. Um, if you wouldn't mind to just restate uh, maybe a little bit about folks that don't have one, but feel that a, a formal committee just feels like a lot to get started. What do you recommend as just a, maybe an easy first step? Right, and, and there are a lot of people that don't know their neighbors or maybe not feel comfortable in the neighborhood that they're living. So my best recommendation is to actually reach out to Corporal Couch, our community service officer. He would know the best ways to help you identify maybe the next neighboring group that is actually uh, involved in the system and they can add them to that group. Um, you might, some people are uncomfortable in reporting crimes and I understand that. I and mean, especially if you live next door to someone and something's happening perhaps in a backyard and the only way someone would see it would be that neighbor. So that's uncomfortable. Um, I would be happy to meet or contact anyone that has a question or concern as to how to address that. And there are some things that council actually can address. Um, and there are other things that are working behind the scene that a lot of our citizens don't know that there might actually be a problem with a property that is being addressed, but it's just not public knowledge. Um, and we know that our law enforcement isn't going to uh, publicize their activities if this is an ongoing investigation. So something may be in the works and just a simple call to city hall or council member or the police department could be that reassurance to let you know that something is in place um, to protect you. But again, my the best thing I can say is to contact Corporal Couch and just reach out to him and he would have the best ways to help that person to either start something maybe online or actually join the next door group. We also do have a uh, anonymous call line and an anonymous um, uh, text message line that you can, and, and it's 100%, it is not, uh, we don't uh, do any kind of uh, caller ID or anything on those. It is 100% anonymous and has been pretty successful, um, but um, that, that's another uh, method if, you're, if you don't want to uh, expose yourself. Mm -hmm. And we also have members of our community that are active in community outreach that may actually be a better point of contact because they might feel more comfortable talking to that type of person rather than the police department. Sure. Yeah, when in doubt, reach out. Online, off, anonymously, or otherwise, never hesitate to just say something if you see something or ask a question. There's always a way to connect folks. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. I'm sorry, Mr. Meyer? I was just going to say, and we'd rather you report something and then we find out that there's nothing, nothing wrong going on there uh, mm -hmm. than to ignore something and, and, and there be something bad going on there. So um, it happens all the time. Somebody lets us know something and we go by and check it out. And no, it was, uh, you know, they, they didn't uh, cut their grass because they were out of town for a couple of weeks or, or they've been sick. 
Um, and we'd much rather find, uh, find that out than to have the opposite happen. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here today to our audience for being here today. Um, again, if you're watching the recorded version, don't hesitate to reach out on social media or elsewhere. Um, and thank you very much. And stay tuned for our next uh, One Cape webinar. It's going to be March 22nd at 1 p.m. Hopefully we'll be back live on Facebook in addition to Zoom and the recorded YouTube uh, recordings. We're going to talk about good governance with uh, Councilman Robbie Gard and Deputy City Manager Molly Maynor. We're gonna talk about how the, the council's fiscal discipline and streamlining services feeds into good gov governance for our community and ultimately a better place to live, work and play. Thank you both for being here today and everyone else, stay safe. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks, Thanks Nicola. Thanks, Shannon. Yep, thank you.